Next, I would like to introduce our speaker today, Elaine Mills. Elaine is a member of the class of 2012 and her primary interest is in sustainable gardening. She created the first set of fact sheets on tried and true native plants that are now a popular resource on our website. You'll be learning more about them today. She spent eight years photographing native plants in public and private gardens and enjoys selecting pictures from her photo library to illustrate her talks, articles, and weekly educational posts on our Facebook group, Instagram, and Twitter. In addition, she serves as one of the coordinators for the Glen Carlin Demonstration Library in Arlington. So welcome, Elaine, and we'll turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Leslie. Welcome everyone to our next presentation in the Sustainable Landscaping series. Uh, we've just recently gone through a, a burst of spring growth with uh, early spring uh, ephemerals, spring wildflowers, and of course, the lovely uh, ornamental flowering trees. And this fall, we'll be looking forward to seeing colorful foliage, uh, beautiful fruits and interesting seed heads, as well as the punch of color from the powerhouse plants, such as the, the asters, the golden rods, and the uh, perennial uh, sunflowers. Uh, today's talk is going to focus on native blooms for the summer garden, native plants that will take you through this transition period between spring and fall, the hot summer months. These plants are uh, ornamentally attractive, and in addition, they will provide wonderful support to our local wildlife. Uh, I'll, I'll begin briefly by discussing the benefits of using native plants, and then we'll look in detail at the species for summer. Most of the plants today will be perennials, but we'll also take a quick look at a couple of vines, some shrubs, some graminoids. These are grasses and uh, sedges and rushes and I'll finish by giving you some resources. So as to the benefits of using native plants, they're suited to our local soil and climate. Um, they have, many of them have very deep roots that are going to be able to reach down into the soil and uh, take them through periods of drought. And because they're adapted, they're not going to need the additions of uh, chemical fertilizers, uh, pesticides and herbicides. And very importantly, these native plants have evolved with the local fauna. They provide nectar and pollen for our pollinators. They serve as host plants for our Lepidoptera. That means they support the entire life cycle of our butterflies and our moths. The adults will come to the plants for nectar and then the females will lay their eggs on the undersides of leaves and the hatching larvae, the, the caterpillars, will be able to feed on that foliage. Native plants also provide fruit and seeds for wildlife, as well as cover for a variety of animals. Now, as Leslie mentioned, uh, in the email that was sent out providing the Zoom link, uh, we also sent out a link to this, um, this two-page handout. It lists all of the plants that I will be discussing today. And the ones that you see underlined in blue uh, have active links. That will take you uh, directly to our tried and true fact sheets on the Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia website. So if, for example, you wanted to take a look at Scarlet Bee Balm, Minarda Didyma, you could go to this detailed fact sheet. It gives you lots of facts, the height, the spread, the bloom color, many characteristics, and lots of growing and maintenance tips. And for many of the plants, you'll also see videos of pollinators that are made by my colleague, um, Mary Free. So these are on the website, mgnv.org. You would get to them uh, following the plants menu tab. But if you have this handout, you can just get directly to the fact sheets for plants you're interested in. Uh, I'd like to mention that these plants are basically native uh, to the mid-Atlantic region. I'll be discussing a few that um, are native outside the, the region. And we'll start uh, looking at perennials. These I'm going to be presenting in a bloom sequence to take you through the summer months. So we'll start with the plants that actually are blooming in springtime and we'll, uh, the bloom will carry on into the summer. So the first is Eastern Red Columbine, Aquilegia canadensis. 
This is an erect branching perennial. It grows in sun to part shade and dry to moist conditions and tolerates quite a few uh, different factors in local urban gardens. It's attractive to hummingbirds, bees, and butterflies. It begins growth with a basal rosette of compound blue-green leaves that will emerge in March. And then in April, you'll begin seeing the flower buds, the nodding red and yellow flowers with those extending stamens will bloom beginning in April and the bloom will continue on into July. And this is what the seed follicles look like. As far as planting and care tips, this plant will reseed in unexpected places. I began growing it, it in um, a woodland area and I would see it hopping and skipping and jumping around in different locations there. And more recently, it's actually moved from that area up into a very sunny part of my garden and it will show up in pathways, in the cracks of sidewalks and driveways. This plant lives about three to five years and is not going to need any dividing. If you want to control the spread, you can simply prune those seed follicles that I showed. And just an alert, this plant is adversely affected by continuous full sun and extreme temperatures. You, you'd want to give it extra water under those conditions. You can use it as shown here in rock gardens, in borders, and as I mentioned, in woodlands. Our next uh, spring blooming to summer blooming plant is scarlet bee balm, Monarda didyma, a clump forming plant that's in the, mid, uh, the mint family. This one uh, actually likes moist to wet soil and is intolerant of dry soil. It attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. It has very showy flowers from May into July and minty scented leaves on the typical square stems of mint family plants. It can colonize both by underground, underground rhizomes and by seed. You can deadhead the plant to prolong its bloom. And very importantly, you'll want to provide good air circulation to prevent powdery mildew. And if that disease should develop, you want to remove the mildewed stems all the way down to the base and place them in the trash rather than in your compost pile. You might want to consider some resistant cultivars. And one good example is Jacob Klein. This plant can be divided every three years to control its spread. And you can use it in herb, butterfly, native flower, and rain gardens. Our next spring to summer plant is Stokes Aster, Stokesia levis. Now this is a plant that's actually native to the Southeast. Um, it does very well in my garden here. But if you're concerned about looking specifically for locally native plants, this would not be one of them. This is a clump forming evergreen plant. And I'll give you a little more details on this one because uh, there is not a fact sheet for it yet. It grows about one to two feet tall, 12 to 18 inches spread in sun to part shade. And it likes moist, well-drained soil. It can tolerate drought, heat, and rabbits and is also deer resistant. It's a great nectar source for butterflies, as you see here. Stokes Aster, as I mentioned, is evergreen and it has a basal rosette that will be refreshed in April. Buds will develop in May, and then you'll see these large fluffy flowers, kind of a lavender color. They have uh, central disc florets, the white ones, and then the notched rays. And these will bloom from June to July. This is a plant that prefers full sun, although it does adapt to many conditions. Again, you can deadhead the spent flowers to encourage rebloom, and you can cut the basal foliage, cut back to the basal foliage after bloom. Uh, just an alert the flower stems may flop after some of the strong. Uh, thunderstorms that we've been experiencing, these extreme weather events that are becoming more frequent these days. Um, and it's intolerant of wet winter soil. Stokes Aster can be used in border fronts or as a ground cover. 
Now this plant uh, appears to have the look of the Southwest, but it is locally native, Eastern prickly pear, Opuntia humifusa. It's a clump forming perennial cactus and it prefers definitely strong sun and very dry conditions. It's uh, tolerant of drought once established and intolerant of shade. This plant attracts butterflies and bees to the flowers and birds enjoy the fruit. Eastern prickly pear has bright flowers uh, from June to July and each of them will just bloom for a single day. Now the pads and fruit are edible, not only by the birds, but by humans as well. The fruits are referred to as tunas and the pads as nopales. And when you're handling them either in the garden or for food preparation, you want to be aware of the thorns and the barbed bristles that are referred to as glockids. This plant is very easy to grow. It will actually root when you just stick the pads in the ground. And you'll want to definitely wear gloves when handling and remove those prickly glockids before cooking the pads. Now I've had quite a few questions in the past about how to go about preparing it. So actually in that handout, I've um, added a link that will take you directly to the Lady Bird Johnson Wildflower Center uh, plant database. And it gives lots of details on how to prepare that plant. You can use it in hell strips or water wise gardens. Now we're moving on into plants that will begin blooming in June and some of them will actually continue on into August. And the first is butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. It grows either in single or multi-stemmed clumps. Prefers uh, sun for the most part. It attracts many pollinators and hummingbirds and also is the larval host for the monarch butterfly. Butterfly weed has lance-shaped leaves on hairy stems and very colorful showy flowers from June to August. You may recognize these spindle-shaped follicles, quite large, and they, uh, the plants will self-seed when those follicles split open and the seeds are carried afar on the air. You'll want to plant young seedlings of butterfly weed. It's difficult to transplant it because of its deep taproot. And just be aware that um, the plant may not begin flowering for a couple of years. Uh, there's a, a saying in, in uh, gardening that, uh, that plants will actually uh, be sleeping, then creeping maybe in their second year, and they'll only begin to really leap and uh, become established and begin flowering more profusely in the third year. Here's something important. You, are not going to want to remove any dead foliage or flowers until after frost because these may harbor the monarch eggs or larvae. Butterfly weed can be used in borders, meadows, or butterfly gardens. Our next perennial is purple coneflower and this is one that's native to central and southeastern United States, Echinacea purpurescens. Excuse me, that should be Echinacea purpurea, a, a typo on my part, I apologize. Uh, this is a tall upright perennial, about two to four feet tall. It tolerates heat and humidity, but not water logging. Uh, it provides a lot of support to our wildlife. It attracts beneficial insects for pollen and nectar, and it offers seeds to goldfinches and is a possible larval host plant. It has multi-season interest with blooms in June to August. These are a complex compound flowers with a, a prominent cone of disc flowers and then the, uh, the ray flowers, the mauve colored petals. It offers flower cones that produce seed for our birds and uh, offers winter interest in the garden. Established plants can actually endure some drought. You'll just want to watch out for any wilting. And uh, in wintertime, prevent any excess soil moisture so you can avoid root rot diseases. Deadheading can extend the bloom period, but then it won't produce those desirable seeds for the goldfinches. 
you can divide the clumps of purple cone flower about every four years when it begins uh, becoming crowded. You can use this in borders, meadows, butterfly gardens, or at the outer edge of rain gardens as shown here. I'd like to make a special note. Uh, purple coneflower, perhaps more than any other native plant, has been bred with many different uh, cultivars. And the straight species has this distinctive uh, central cone and ray flowers. And this is what a cutaway of that looks like. You can see the, the nectaries up at the top, they're producing nectar, and then they'll have pollen. So an alert is that the cultivars that lack that large central cone should be avoided. These are the double flowered cultivars. And if you look at the cutaway of those, you'll see that um, the, the nectaries, the pollen producing areas have been replaced by extra petals. So these essentially are sterile flowers. They've replaced the functioning of the nectaries and seed production, and they're not going to be of any benefit for our pollinators. And this has definitely been shown by their low performance in pollinator trials at Mount Cuba. Indian pink uh, is a plant that's native to the southeast, but it does well in this area. Uh, this particular plant is grown in uh, one of the gardens that, that I help manage, uh, the Glen Carlin Library Garden. Indian pink is Spigelia marylandica. This is another one that doesn't have a fact sheet. It's an erect clump forming plant, about one to two feet tall and as much as 18 inches across. It grows in part shade to shade and prefers moist, rich soil. It can actually tolerate wet soil and deer will rarely damage this plant due to the alkaloids and calcium oxalate crystals in its stems and foliage. It's favored by hummingbirds because of that bright red color and butterflies are also coming to it for nectar. Indian pink has pairs of glossy leaves and trumpet shaped star-like flowers that will bloom from June to August. And then these are followed by these interesting seed capsules. Indian pink is hardy and adaptable uh, but just an alert, it does not compete well with aggressive plants. You'll want to plant it by the end of July to have it established well in the current year. And uh, next year, be aware that it will emerge somewhat late in the spring. You can prolong the blooming season by deadheading the spent flowers. Uh, you can use it in shaded borders, woodland gardens, and water gardens. Our next perennial is garden phlox, Phlox paniculata. This is the tallest of our native phloxes at two to four feet tall, and it grows in upright multi-stemmed clumps. It tolerates clay soil and black walnut. I know a lot of folks are concerned about that, but it's intolerant of drought and deer and rabbits may damage it. It's a great nectar source for both Lepidoptera and hummingbirds and a larval host to moths. Garden Phlox has pointed elliptic leaves on very stiff stems. And it has large clusters of fragrant tubular flowers with a long bloom period from June to August. And you can find it in quite a few different colors. You'll want to mulch this plant to keep the root zone cool and it must be watered during dry spells, but uh, uh, it's important to avoid overhead watering. The reason for this is that uh, garden phlox is prone to powdery mildew. So another good uh, planting tip is to provide good cir air circulation around the plant. And you may want to consult the Mount Cuba report. Uh, I've provided a link to this in your handout. This will discuss uh, perhaps some cultivars that are more resistant to powdery mildew. Again, you can dead uh, head the plant to prolong the bloom. And because those uh, stalks are tall, they may require some staking. You can use it in mixed borders and in butterfly gardens. And our la uh, last plant in this June to August uh, growth period is cup plant, Silphium perfoliatum. This one is an upright, coarse, sunflower-like plant. It can reach heights of up to eight feet 
um, tall and as much as three feet across. It prefers full sun and moist to wet soil and uh, has a great deal of tolerance for various conditions and is deer resistant. Cup plant has large triangular basal leaves. And then the reason it's referred to as cup plant is that it has these joined leaves that form a cup around the thick square stem. And these will collect uh, rainwater that uh, is used by birds. Cup plant has numerous composite flowers from June to August that are attractive to our pollinators and uh, that like the bees and butterflies as well. And this is what the seeds look like. Some planting and care tips. You'll want to site a cup plant very carefully. It's a large plant, it requires a lot of space and it's difficult to dig up once it's established. It's slow to grow it from seed, so you may find that it's uh, easier to use either plugs or potted plants to get it started, and it will self-seed in optimum conditions. This is a plant that you'll want to use at the rear of borders because of its height. It's also excellent for meadows and in open woodland areas. Now we're moving on into plants that will bloom uh, not just from June, but actually uh, all the way into September. And the first of these is threadleaf Coreopsis, Coreopsis verticillata. This grows in dense bushy clumps, uh, anywhere from six inches to 36 inches high. It tolerates drought, heat, humidity, but not waterlogged soils, and deer will rarely damage it. It attracts butterflies and other pollinators. It gets its name because of the fine textured foliage, these thread-like leaves that uh, appear on the stems in whorls. It flowers in loose clusters and those blooms will last, as I mentioned, from June to September. A popular cultivar is the moonbeam cultivar that has lemon yellow flowers. This plant is great for areas with poor dry soil. We refer to these sometimes as hell strips. In fact, it will uh, often flop in moist, rich soil. You can deadhead threadleaf coreopsis for continuous blooms and actually shear it about midsummer for fall rebloom. It spreads both by underground rhizomes and reseeding and can be divided every two to three years. You can use it in borders, cutting gardens, meadows, or containers. And it's shown here in the hell strips at the front of our sunny demonstration garden. A plant that many people are, are not familiar with is oxi, also referred to as false sunflower, Heliopsis helianthoides. I've really enjoyed using this in, in my garden. It's an upright clumping plant, about three to six feet tall. It grows in sun to part shade and moist, uh, dry to moist conditions, tolerates quite a few different conditions and a deer rarely damage it. Great uh, support plant for our wildlife. It offers nectar and pollen to many pollinators. Birds will eat the seeds that form and it also offers winter cover for beneficial insects. It has opposite toothed leaves on stiff branch stems. Abundant long blooming composite flowers from June to September. This is a look at the buds and the fairly large blossoms that are about two inches across. This is a plant that you can cut uh, back by about one half in May to reduce the need for staking. And a resource that I would like to mention is the well-tended perennial garden. This offers wonderful uh, techniques on pruning techniques um, by Tracy de Sabato Oost. Uh, and this uh, uh, cutting back technique can be used for other uh, tall plants to, to reduce the need for staking. Uh, it will need more support if you're planting it in the shade. It will be a reaching to grow toward the sun. Another plant that you can deadhead to extend the bloom time 
And unfortunately, it does have some susceptibility to aphids. But if you're growing a variety of native plants that will attract the beneficial predatory insects, this uh, should help stave those off. Uh, you can use oxi in borders, cutting gardens, and meadows. Our next perennial is wild bergamot, Monarda fistulosa, uh, another plant like the previous uh, scarlet bee balm in the mint family, has a, a similar growth habit. It's a deer resistant because of that minty taste. This attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees. It's a larval host for moths and also offers winter food for birds. As I mentioned, it has minty leaves. They're opposite on square stems, typical of the mint family plants. It has two-lipped tubular flowers, and these bloom all the way from June to September. And this is what the uh, nutlets will look like for the birds in October. You'll want to grow wild bergamot in full sun and prune it to uh, allow for good air circulation. This is another of the plants that can be prone to powdery mildew. Another one you can deadhead to prolong the bloom and it spreads both by creeping rhizomes and seeds. So you can choose to either retain or remove those seed heads and divide it in March every two to three years. This is a great plant to use mast in borders or in meadows as shown here. Our next plant is Anis hyssop. This one is native to the upper Midwest, Agastache funiculum, but it does grow extremely well here. It's an upright clump forming plant, about two to four feet tall and 18 to 36 inches wide. It grows in sun to part shade and likes dry to moist, well-drained soil. It will tolerate drought and dry soil and is deer resistant as a member of the mint family. It attracts hummingbirds, butterflies, and bees, and birds will feed on its seeds. It has anise scented foliage on square stems, and this uh, foliage can be used in teas and potpourris. It has very densely packed lavender flower spikes that will bloom from June to September. And these are the long lasting seed heads that will attract the birds. Anise hyssop does best in full sun and you'll want to provide good soil drainage to prevent root rot. Also watch out for powdery mildew. You can use those flower spikes in fresh or dried flower arrangements deadhead it to promote additional blooming and be aware that it spreads both by rhizomes and self-seeding. It can be used in borders, herb gardens, meadows, and butterfly gardens. Here's what it looks like, a very ornamental with those seed heads in the fall. Uh, we'll pause at this point. We're about halfway through looking at our perennials and we'll take any questions. Uh, have you seen any coming in, Julie? Yes, Elaine, we have a few. Um, some of them you may have already touched on, but I think it'll be a, a helpful review um, and beneficial for any newcomers. So the first one is, does bee balm spread prolifically? Uh, bee balm, the scarlet bee balm, Monarda didyma, does spread. The mint family plants uh, tend to spread by those rhizomes, but I have found that they, the roots aren't extremely deep. So if I just keep on top of that spread, I just become aware when it's inching uh, out away from my intended preferred area, I find that I can take uh, those mint family plants up fairly easily. Okay, and <clears throat> for review, when and how deeply should Stokes Aster be pruned? Okay, uh, Stokes Aster should be pruned back when it's finished blooming. And Stokes Aster was the one that will bloom um, on into, on perhaps into July. And you'll want to cut the, those stems back. The stems will really extend out quite a, a distance from 
from the basal foliage and they tend to be a little bit on the floppy side. So you'll want to cut those all the way back down to the basal foliage. And that basal foliage is evergreen. Mine lasted well, even through uh, the ice and, um, and w winter temperatures that, that we had this past winter. Do any of the plants you mentioned today compete well against English ivy? English ivy is, is a very problematic plant. It, it, it in fact, is, is listed as an invasive plant, uh, both by Arlington County and Alexandria, as well as many other uh, regions of the United States. I would personally recommend the removal of English ivy um, it, it's just a, per, a pernicious plant, especially when it's allowed to grow vertically. That's when it will flower, uh, fruit will form, and, and then the uh, fruit can be carried afar by birds and will spread into our, our forested areas. Um, I prepared a presentation on invasive plants and native alternatives. It's one of the plants, uh, excuse me, one of the recordings in um, on our website um, under public education. And uh, I give some important information about how you can go about uh, removing English ivy, how you can replace it. I would suggest plants, um, plants like the mints to, to actually replace it if you want to have a plant that will spread over an area. If you prefer lower growing plants, you might want to look at a presentation I gave on ground covers, native ground covers for sun and shade. And some of them are quite robust and they, and they could be good replacements for English ivy. Okay, um, thank you. You mentioned um, pinching back in general, but here's a specific question about phlox. Can you pinch phlox back to keep it shorter and less likely to lean? And if so, when should this be done so you don't lose any blooms? Yes, uh, phlox, uh, a, a number of those tall plants that I've mentioned, um, the, the, the bee balm, um, the, the oxide that we just talked about, um, the, these, these taller plants can be pinched back. And I've actually begun pinching back my plants like my Joe pieweed, my phlox, uh, New England aster. I've been pinching them back already um, in, in the past week or so. I find that some of them will put on um, a burst of, of growth and I'll actually pinch them back maybe several times during the growing season. Um, the general rule of thumb is that you won't want to be pinching them back any later than around the 4th of July. They can be pinched back. Sometimes I'll just pinch out the little, the little um, new leaves that haven't quite opened up in the very tip. And sometimes I'll actually cut back to where I see um, a join of, of leaves coming out from the stem. I'll actually use some, some shears and, and cut them back. And you can cut them back um, sometimes even by about a, a third uh, as they're in that growing period. Okay, does um, pinching back, um, can that be used with peonies? That, that's a bit far afield of this talk, but. Well, peonies are not a native plant. Um, I, I have to admit, I, I'm not aware of that, but I, I don't, I'm not sure that that technique will work. But a book that would have information on that would very likely be the one I referred to, The Well-Tended Perennial Garden. That uh, has very specific care instructions uh, and, and, uh, and ma maintenance techniques for uh, very individual plants. There's, there's separate paragraphs, separate pages on, on each of the plants that um, De Sabato Oost discusses. Mm -hmm. Now, I actually use uh, cages, special little cages that I try to put around my peonies real early in the growing season. So they will, uh, the stems will actually grow up through the cage and that will provide support. Okay, and can you clarify pinching versus cutting? Are these terms used interchangeably? Uh, pinching back is when you're actually using your fingertips to nip out the, the, the new growth, those very, uh, the, 
the new little leaves that, are, that haven't quite unfolded yet. Cutting back is when you're actually using shears to cut back further down the stem to where there's um, a new, uh, there's a, a set of leaves growing out, but they're not the newest leaves. The pinching back is with the new leaves. Okay, but it is possible to actually get out um, scissors and cut back. I, I do that with some of my plants, uh, some of the ones that, that grow more robustly, I will do that. Okay, and is oxide prone to aphids? As I mentioned, oxi, the false sunflower, is prone to aphids. Uh, I unfortunately had an infestation of them on my plants last year. Um, most of the plants I've been discussing don't have particular pest uh, issues. The, the, the most uh, prevalent problem is, is that powdery mildew that I've mentioned for a number of plants. But if you tend to grow a whole garden of native plants, you'll encourage uh, plants, uh, excuse me, you'll encourage beneficial insects, some of the predatory insects that will help deal with those aphids. Okay. And in, I believe in the next session, you will talk about gay feather or liatris, correct? That's correct. Um, are we ready to move on then to that next portion of the talk? I think we have one more question. Uh, and I think you've been doing this as you've gone along. Of, of the perennials that you um, have mentioned so far, are any of them particularly aggressive that gardeners should know about? Um, well, I would just say that the that the mint plants, the the bee balm, um, and the wild bergamot, because they're mints, they are going they are going to tend to spread. But I found growing them myself that that I can that I can manage that. If, if, you, if you find that it's uh, a, a little too aggressive your taste, maybe choose some of the, some of the other plants that we are uh, talking about. Okay, and the last question before we go on, do you have any favorite self-sowers? Favorite self-sowers? Well, quite a few of these will self-sow. Um, I guess one that does it quite a bit would be, um, the threadleaf coreopsis, uh, I found that, uh, and and again though that um, well and and the red columbine, uh, that's the very first plant we discussed. That one really uh, self sows very freely, and that's the one that you you'll get little surprises as it shows up in different parts of your garden where you haven't planted it. Okay, thank you, Elaine. I think we'll. Go to the next section now. Okay, we're going to continue looking at perennials. And uh, these will be plants that uh, are starting to bloom in July. The first is swamp milkweed, Asclepius incarnata, a loose clumping multi-stemmed plant about four to six feet tall. This one, uh, true to its name, likes moist to wet soil. It will actually uh, tolerate temporary flooding although it can also tolerate some drought once it's established and be alert that deer, uh, excuse me, deer will seldom severely damage this one. Uh, this one attracts native bees, other uh, beneficial insects, and it's the larval host for the monarch butterfly. It has flat clusters of fragrant flowers. Uh, these uh, form of the perfect landing pads for butterflies. Although as you can see here, it's uh, attractive to bees as well. And this will bloom from July to August. It has lance shaped leaves. And as mentioned, it will, this plant will support the full life cycle of the monarch butterfly. Like the, uh, the shorter uh, butterfly weed, it has these tear shaped seed follicles. This one spreads both by seed and underground rhizomes, and you'll want to uh, remove any unwanted shoots or those seed follicles before uh, splitting if you don't want it to spread in your garden. Um, again, as, as with the butterfly weed, you'll want to retain that dead foliage um, and flowers until after frost because they may harbor the monarch eggs or larvae. And this plant is an excellent, excellent substitute for non-native butterfly bush. That plant is actually considered invasive in Arlington and Alexandria, Virginia. Uh, and this native swamp milkweed uh, supports the entire life cycle. The adult butterflies, both male and female with the nectar and then the larval stage of the butterflies, the caterpillars 
um, as a host plant. Swamp milkweed can be used in butterfly gardens, bogs, and rain or water gardens. Our next plant is blazing star, also referred to sometimes as gay feather because of that feathery foliage. Its uh, scientific name is Liatris spicata. It grows with tall unbranched stems, about one to four feet uh, tall in sun to part shade. It uh, tolerates clay soil, drought, heat, and humidity, but is intolerant of waterlogged soil, rarely damaged by deer. Uh, Blazing Star attracts bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds, and many birds will come to consume the seeds. It begins growth with this feathery foliage and then sends up these tall spikes of fluffy flowers that bloom from July into August. And interestingly, these will bloom from the top down. This is a look at the seed heads. This plant is good as a cut or dried flower, and it seldom needs support despite its height. It may need division in the fourth or the fifth year, and you'll want to protect young plants from herbivores and voles may eat the corms underground. You can use this en masse in borders, butterfly gardens, cutting gardens, or meadows. Our next uh, plant for the uh, July to August period is Turk's cap lily, Lilium superbum. This uh, is a bulb. It uh, grows a, a stout unbranched stem as tall as seven feet high. It grows in sun to part shade and prefers moist to wet humusy soil, even tolerates wet soil, but be alert that deer may severely damage it. It attracts both hummingbirds because of that bright orange color, as well as large insects. It has lance-shaped leaves that grow from the stem in whorls, and a single plant can have up to 40 buds. It has very large nodding flowers, maybe uh, three or four inches across uh, in July and August, and they have these interesting exerted stamens that extend well beyond the corolla. You'll want to plant the bulbs about five to six inches deep in the fall and mulch to keep the root zone cool. You'll also want to maintain consistent moisture for this plant. And this is one that may require staking for support. It spreads by windborne seeds and by bulb offsets. Unlike the non-native tiger lily, which looks very similar, um, that one has what are referred to as bulbils. They're little um, bulbs, little dark black bulbs that will form in the leaf axils. And that is how that non-native plant uh, reproduces. You can use a Turk's cap lily mast in low spots, in rain gardens and by pond edges. Our next plant, we're now moving into July to September bloom time, is a short toothed mountain mint, Hycnanthema muticum. This is a clumping plant, uh, one to three feet high and wide. Sun to part shade and moist uh, soil are its favorite conditions, although it can tolerate drought and it's deer resistant as a member of the mint family. This plant uh, tested number one in pollinator trials that were conducted a number of years ago by Penn State Extension. It was number one both for the variety of pollinators and the total number of pollinators that visited. It has aromatic foliage on square stems and clustered tubular flowers that bloom from July to September. And what appear to be uh, leaves on either side of the white a cluster of flowers are actually silvery bracts that give a very fresh uh, look, silvery look to the garden in the summer. This is a look at the interesting lingering seed heads. This plant does its best flowering in sun and it's less drought tolerant than the other mint. So just be aware of that. It's a very vigorous grower as a mint. So you can prune the roots in the spring to control its spread. And a rust is a, a condition that may sometimes occur. 
It's best used en masse in uh, border perimeters. You can allow it to actually naturalize in cottage gardens or in meadows. Our next plant is Swamp Rose Mallow, Hibiscus Mashutos. This is a perennial, but it actually has rather a, a shrubby habit with multiple sturdy stems. It can reach up to seven feet in height and as much as nine feet across. It grows in sun and moist to wet conditions, uh, tolerates wet soil heat and humidity, but be aware that deer may severely damage it. It attracts bees and hummingbirds to the nectar and is a larval host to Lepidoptera. It has very large toothed leaves and large flowers with a crimson eye from July to September, and it has a pink flowered variant. This is a look at the seed capsules that will last through the winter. This uh, plant, Swamp Rose Mallow, grows best in full sun and you'll want to site it away from wind uh, and provide good air circulation to prevent disease. D regular deep watering will be needed if you don't plant it as it, it's shown here right beside a, a pond. And uh, be alert that new growth uh, will be slow to emerge in the spring. You can pinch back the growing tips at eight and 12 inches uh, to create bushier plants and you can deadhead the individual flowers. Use it in moist borders, containers, in rain gardens, and by ponds. Another of our native uh, hibiscus is scarlet rose mallow, Hibiscus coccineus, another shrubby woody based plant, three to six feet high and two to three feet wide. This one will grow in sun to part shade also prefers moist to wet soil and tolerates our summer conditions of heat and humidity. This one attracts bees and hummingbirds for the nectar and its foliage serves as a larval host to Lepidoptera. It has hemp-like palmately compound leaves. This is a look at the buds and it has very large uh, colorful flowers from July to September with a very showy uh, staminal column in the center. And it does have a white variant. This again grows best in full sun and be aware that the plants may become somewhat leggy in the shade. You'll want to maintain soil moisture through the growing season if it's not uh, growing right beside a stream or a pond. And taller plants may need staking. It has some susceptibility to pests and disease, although I haven't witnessed it uh, personally either in the garden where we uh, grow at the demonstration garden or in my own garden. You can use this because of its height at the rear of moist borders, or you can group it along the edge of ponds or streams. The last of our flowers that begins blooming in July is woodland sunflower. Helianthus divericatus. This is a shrubby woody based plant about two to six feet high, tolerates drought and watch out deer and rabbits may nibble it. This provides great uh, wildlife support. It has many pollinators, including specialist bees. Um, it's considered by Doug Tellamy, the entomologist as uh, one of our keystone plants because it provides uh, serves as a larval host to so many Lepidoptera. Uh, seeds are enjoyed by the birds and colonies of this plant can actually provide wildlife cover. It has long lance-shaped leaves. This is a look at the buds. And then these open up into large composite flowers from July to September. And these are the seeds for the birds. Woodland sunflower is easily grown in well-drained soil and prefers partial shade, such as that at a woodland edge. It's tolerant of a range of soils and makes a good cut flower. Tall plants, if you don't pinch them back, may need staking and it will spread via rhizomes over time. You can divide it every three to four years to control that spread and to maintain the vigor of the plants. You can use in partially shaded borders or in naturalized plantings. Now we'll be moving on into the plants 
that bloom, start blooming in July and the bloom will actually uh, extend into the fall, into October. And the first of these is uh, coastal plain Joe pieweed, Eutrochium dubium, a very tall plant with upright unbranched stems. This likes moist soil, will actually tolerate clay and wet soil. And uh, because it's robust, deer will rarely damage it. It attracts a variety of bees and butterflies. Songbirds will enjoy the seeds that form, and it's also the larval host to various moths. It has lance-shaped leaves that appear in whorls on purple speckled stems. And it forms uh, large dome-shaped clusters of pink flowers from July to October and continues its multi-season interest into the fall with these fluffy seed heads. They also look beautiful with sun and, uh, excuse me, with uh, snow and ice in the wintertime. This is another excellent example of a plant that you can control its height by pinching back early in the growing season. As I mentioned, I've already uh, pinched mine back um, several weeks ago. You can retain the stems of this plant. Uh, stems of, of plants that are larger than pencil size uh, can be retained through the winter for overwintering bees. And you would cut those back, uh, cut those stalks back to 12 inches in the spring. If you don't care for the height of this plant, you might want to consider a shorter cultivar, Little Joe, uh, that grows three to four feet high without pinching back. You can use this in borders, cottage gardens, meadows, naturalized areas, or rain gardens. You would use it in the central portion of those rain gardens. Our next perennial is orange coneflower, Rudbeckia fulgida, an upright clumping plant. This one prefers uh, sun and tolerates heat, drought, and clay soil, although it is susceptible to our deer overpopulation. Orange coneflower attracts butterflies and other pollinators. It's the larval host to the silvery checker spot butterfly and birds eat its seeds. It has ovate leaves on very hairy stems. This is a look at the buds and it has fairly large composite flowers with dark disc florets that bloom from July to October. This one blooms best in the sun and another plant to deadhead for continuous bloom. You can use it either as a cut or a dried flower and it retains its winter interest in your garden with the dark seed heads. You can prune it to the ground in late winter and if you want to propagate it, divide it in early spring. This is one that will spread by rhizomes. You can use it massed in borders, in a cutting garden or in meadows. White turtle head, Chelone glabra, another upright clump forming plant. This one prefers moist to wet soil and will actually tolerate wet soil and temporary flooding. Be alert that deer may occasionally severely damage it. It attracts bees, butterflies, and hummingbirds and is the larval host for the Baltimore checker spot butterfly. It's a very robust plant. It has lance-shaped leaves on stout erect stems and these very distinctive hooded tulipped flowers from July to October. Uh, the native bumblebees are the, the bees that are strong enough to pry apart those lips to, to go inside to get the nectar and pollen. Uh, Chelone leonii, the pink flowered version, is not locally native, but it does grow well here. And this is a look at the ova ovoid seed capsules on these tall stalks. With white turtle head, another plant that you'll want to maintain good air circulation and soil moisture to prevent that powdery mildew. Uh, mulch it in sunny areas and become aware that it may become leggy if you're growing it in the shade. You could stake it if necessary, or you could pinch back the stems in the spring as we've discussed, to reduce its height. You can use it in shade, woodland, bog, or rain gardens. There are two lobelias, Lobelia cardinalis and Lobelia syphilitica. Cardinal flower is Lobelia cardinalis, the, the red flowered 
plant and great blue lobelia, lobelia syphilitica, has the purplish blue flowers. These both grow on thick, rigid, erect stems. They're a fairly tall, two to four feet tall, and they prefer moist, rich, humus rich soil. Deer will seldom severely damage them except when they're young. They are attractive to native bees for both nectar and pollen and butterflies and hummingbirds will seek nectar. They begin growth with these basal leaves and then will send up these unbranched leafy stems. They both have tubular tulipped flowers on uh, spike-like racemes from July all the way into October. And this is a look at the seed heads in the fall. Cardinal flower is short-lived, so you'll want to allow it to self-seed to continue on in your garden. And great blue lobelia may also self-seed to form colonies. You can divide the clumps of these plants by separating any basal offshoots in either the spring or the fall. And be very careful not to cover the basal leaves uh, with mulch over the winter. That will cause them just to rot out and die back. Both of the lobelias can be used in woodland gardens, in rain gardens, and near ponds and streams. Uh, we can pause again for questions. We're at the end of our discussion of perennial plants. We just have a few, Elaine. Um, okay. Could you um, tell us, what is, is there a difference between swamp milkweed and common milkweed? Yes, there is. There are several milkweeds that are native to our area. Um, common milkweed is Asclepius syriaca. I consider that um, a coarser plant. It has you know, very thick stems, uh, large leaves, and the flowers will form, they're pink flowers, they'll form in, in clusters, ball-like clusters. For, for, my, for my taste, it uh, is a little too aggressive in the garden. It will spread both by rhizomes and self-seeding and, and will spread a, like the um, like the columbine, I'll find it uh, cropping up in unexpected areas around the garden. So that is one that I personally choose not to use, but it, it does provide excellent support uh, to the monarchs. Swamp milkweed um, grows maybe a little bit shorter. I consider it um, a slightly more delicate plant, more ornamentally pleasing. It uh, again has uh, pink flowers. They grow in flatter clusters. And I think, I think of the flowers as being maybe uh, a slightly darker pink. That, that plant is definitely going to want to prefer moisture conditions. The, the Syriaca, Asclepius Syriaca can, can grow in, in, in fairly normal garden conditions. And then the shortest of the milkweeds, the one I discussed earlier, the, the butterfly weed, uh, only grows um, several feet tall. And that one actually prefers dry conditions. Okay. All three of them provide excellent support, both uh, uh, from a standpoint of nectar for the uh, monarch adults, as, as well as for other pollinators. And then it serves as the larval host plant for, uh, for the monarch caterpillars. Great. Um, and is, will ironweed be included in this presentation? Ironweed, uh, let's see, I guess that's one that I didn't, I didn't mention. That's because I tend to think of it blooming a, a, a bit later. I can describe it briefly. It's uh, quite a tall plant in my garden. It's even reached maybe six or seven feet tall, fairly robust with lance-shaped leaves. And it has uh, beautiful clusters of red violet flowers, uh, composite flowers, very attractive to, um, to our pollinators. This is another one that you could, you could pinch back or cut back. Um, I find it's fairly aggressive in my garden. I, if I don't, uh, if it grows beyond where I want it to grow and I don't uh, pull up the young seedlings, I find that it, that it can be something of a challenge to uproot it. It's, it's a very deep rooted plant, but uh, provides wonderful uh, support support and I do use it at the back of my garden beds. But I, I think of it as maybe a later blooming plant, maybe starting to bloom in August and, and going on into the fall. Okay. Um, I think that's that's all we have for this section. 
Okay, excellent. All right, we're going to move on now to, um, to some woody plants. And um, I'm not going to cover them in quite as much depth. Um, I am going to be giving a presentation, I'll give you more information about this, a presentation exclusively on vines uh, coming up very soon this summer. So I'm just going to introduce the uh, two vines fairly quickly. Uh, they are excellent for our, from an ornamental standpoint and for wildlife support. The first of these is trumpet or uh, coral honeysuckle, Lonicera semper virens. It has these lovely uh, trumpet shaped bright colored flowers. Uh, with world flower clusters, very attractive to hummingbirds especially. And uh, this will bloom from April to June, so right th uh, from spring into the summer months. And in fact, I find that it will bloom intermittently into the fall, and mine has actually bloomed um, in mild winters as late as December. Uh, the pollinated flowers will form this lovely fruit uh, from August. Uh, it will stay on the a vine until March, and this is very nutritious for our birds. This is an excellent vine for trellises, arbors, and fences, or you can use it as a sprawling ground cover. Uh, another of our native uh, summer blooming vines is passion flower, Passiflora incarnata. It has very showy fragrant flowers, very complex flower parts. They will bloom from July all the way into September. And those pollinated flowers will form this interesting egg-shaped fruit. It's referred to as maypops. It will form in July and the fruits will mature in the fall. Now the name maypops, I've, I've heard it explained in two different ways. One, that the, the fruit, if it uh, falls and lands, may tend to, to pop with a large, uh, a, a loud sound but it also, the plant will pop out in bloom in, in May. So it, it has two different explanations for that common name. Uh, this plant can be grown on arbors, trellises, and fences. Now we'll take a quick look at some shrubs. I've given uh, a presentation on native shrubs as alternatives to some of the overused foundation plants. I'll tell you about that presentation shortly. Um, so I won't go into a great deal of detail here, but we'll, we'll look quickly at some uh, summer blooming shrubs. Uh, the first is oak leaf hydrangea, hydrangea quercifolia, named for its oak shaped leaves. This will flower late in May all the way into July, and it will change colors. The blossoms will begin almost a greenish white, and then they'll turn pink. This is a great plant to use uh, in your foundations, uh, in an informal hedge, or as an accent or specimen plant. A shrub, some people may not even realize it's a shrub, it's referred to as um, a stemless shrub, is common yucca. Another plant uh, like, the, um, like the prickly pear that has a, a look of the southwest, but it actually is native here, yucca filamentosa. It grows uh, with a basal rosette of somewhat sharp uh, sword-shaped leaves with the, with the curly filaments on the edges, giving it its species name, filamentosa. Uh, those uh, rosettes are about three feet tall. And then in June, it will send up a very tall, six foot tall flower stalk with these lovely waxy white flowers that are very attractive, especially to moths. It will add architectural height to dry borders. It prefers uh, sunny locations, but as shown here, it can actually grow in part shade. Our next shrub is New Jersey tea, Ceanothus americanus. It blooms in June and is very attractive to a wide variety of pollinators, and then forms these very interesting seed heads in July. This can be used as a foundation plant an informal hedge, or as a specimen plant in dry areas. I've actually recommended it for some hell strips, those very hot uh, curbside areas in parking lots. And because it has such uh, deep roots, it, it did quite well there. Uh, our next shrub is buttonbush, Cephalanthus occidentalis, 
has very interesting uh, blooms from June to July that look almost like uh, miniature satellites. This is a, a very attractive to a wide variety of pollinators. It forms this interesting fruit in the fall. You'll want to use this in moist shrub borders by ponds and rain gardens. I've seen it growing at uh, Kenilworth Gardens where uh, it uh, surrounds uh, ponds that, that have our uh, water lilies. American beautyberry uh, is the native of beautyberry, Calicarpa americana. It blooms in early July with these uh, interesting uh, clusters that, of uh, lavender flowers that so actually surround the stem. And these will turn into this beautiful magenta fruit, very nutritious for a, a large number of our native birds in the fall. This can be used en masse in shrub borders or naturalized in landscapes like this woodland landscape. Sweet pepper bush, Clethra alnifolia, will have fragrant blooms from July to August, very attractive to uh, both bees and butterflies. Ruby spice is a cultivar that uh, appears to, to remain attractive to our pollinators. And um, there are also some shorter cultivars if you wanted one with a, a shorter height. Um, the straight species has white flowers. You can use this uh, sweet pepper bush in moist shrub borders, in rain gardens, or in butterfly and hummingbird gardens. Steeple bush, uh, a native spirea, spirea tomentosa, has woolly toothed leaves and these beautiful flower plumes from July to September. This is attractive to use as a hedge in rain gardens or by pond edges. And we'll conclude looking at some graminoids. The first is bottle brush grass, Elemus hystrix. This is what's referred to as a cool season grass. It will start with a burst of, of growth in the spring. And it has these strap-like leaves, almost a, a bamboo-like appearance. There may be, oh, about an inch wide and a, a, a foot or so long. And what makes it so distinctive are these bristly inflorescences. They will be, uh, as they turn dry, and, and seed, they'll be very attractive to the birds. Uh, these will appear from June to July. And this plant is very attractive when it's massed in lightly shaded woodland settings. Another uh, attractive grass with summer bloom is switchgrass, Panicum virgatum. This is a warm season grass. That means it will get uh, off to a slower start. This is what it looks like with um, its early growth in the spring, it will eventually develop the wide arching leaves that you see in the photograph on the right. Those uh, leaves are, are several feet long. And what makes this particular grass so distinctive are these beautiful airy inflorescences with a, a pinkish color. And these will begin forming in July and remain on the plant, taking on kind of a tan color all the way through to February. This plant is, is fairly popular in the horticulture trade and it has a wide variety of landscape uses. Uh, can be used as an accent plant as shown here, uh, planted en masse as a screen or for erosion control on a slope. River oats, uh, Chasmanthium latifolium, uh, also has bamboo-like leaves and these interesting oat-like inflorescences that change color uh, through the seasons. They'll begin uh, with this green color, they'll turn pink and then uh, turn a dark tawny color as they uh, remain on the plant from July through the winter time. This is a plant, uh, this one grows a little more aggressively. Uh, so you'll, uh, you could use it in rain gardens and especially on slopes to control erosion in shady areas. And I believe this is our, uh, excuse me, we got two more plants. This one is common rush, Juncus effusus. It uh, appears prickly, but it actually has soft leafless stems. This is a look at the flowers that will appear in the summertime from July to September. And very attractive to use as an accent plant 
uh, looks attractive in containers, but you could also use it in rain gardens and on slopes to control erosion. This is a plant that can actually grow in standing water up to about four inches deep. And our final plant is purple lovegrass, Aerogrostis spectabilis. It begins growth with this basal clump and then will send up these reddish purple inflorescences, uh, almost a beautiful purplish haze that will uh, continue from July through to October. And it's attractive to use in borders, meadows, and as edging for paths. Now, um, this presentation is being offered to you by uh, our particular unit, the Arlington Alexandria Unit of Virginia Cooperative Extension, as well as Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. Uh, our group of volunteers are uh, trained by Virginia Cooperative Extension to share science-based information from our two land-grant colleges, Virginia Tech and Virginia State University. And we do this in a number of ways. You've heard uh, from Leslie about our help desk. Um, normally you would be able to come in and visit us at our headquarters in Fairlington, uh, in Arlington, Virginia. At the present time, we're, remote, uh, we're operating remotely and you can contact us at the uh, email address shown here, mg for Master Gardener, arl for Arlington, alex for Alexandria at gmail.com. We would normally be holding plant, plant clinics at various farmers markets and at Arlington Central Library, and we hope to reestablish those. Uh, we have quite a number of demonstration gardens throughout the area, and you can learn about the locations of those on our website, mgnv.org. And of course, we offer many classes almost weekly via Zoom at the present time. And the recordings of those classes are on the MGNV website. Uh, under public education. Uh, our particular unit of VCE is supported by a nonprofit group, Master Gardeners of Northern Virginia. We have the aforementioned website and uh, we have many uh, daily uh, postings on Facebook. I also do uh, weekly uh, fa <coughs> Facebook postings um, on native plants as well as daily uh, postings on Instagram and Twitter. As I mentioned, we have a number of recorded presentations that you may want to look at. Uh, you'll want to go to our website, look under the public education tab, and under that, the Master Gardener Virtual Classroom, and the subcategory is Sustainable Landscaping. So you can look at the one I mentioned on native alternatives to overused foundation plants for much more information on the shrubs that I've described briefly today. And then the second uh, presentation was on native grasses, sedges, and rushes for the home garden. And coming up, there will be a presentation on native vines for the home garden. We haven't uh, finalized the date, but it will be sometime in August. And you can register if you want to hear the live presentation at mgnv.org under public education, RSVP to attend. And then the recording of that will appear on the website should you miss the live presentation and uh, want to, to refer to that in the future. Uh, also under resources, I want to mention some locations where you can see native plants if you're here in the Northern Virginia area. As I mentioned, we have um, a number of demonstration gardens and the upper left photo is from our sunny demonstration garden. In Washington, DC, there's the US National Arboretum and the U.S. Botanic Garden, especially the Outdoor National Garden, uh, Meadowlark Botanical Gardens, and uh, Green Spring Botanic Gardens uh, locally, as well as the garden pictured in the center, the little pocket garden behind the Nature Conservancy uh, headquarters in Arlington, Virginia. And for those of you who may want to buy native plants, I refer you to the Plant Nova Natives website. There they will have a page that lists native only sellers. There are several that are right here in the Northern Virginia area, some that are a little further afield, but these native only sellers will be able to, to give you very uh, detailed information about the plants you're seeking. To finish up, do we have any last questions, Julie? Yes, we do. So um, 
A quick question, is it too late to pinch back ironweed? So we do have a question about ironweed after June 10th. Uh, I, I think that should be okay. As I mentioned near the beginning of the presentation, I think we usually consider early July, the, the 4th of July, we use that as kind of our benchmark for the point at which it's, it's, it's too late to pinch back. Otherwise you'd be removing the chance for flowering. Mm -hmm. And can trumpet honeysuckle be trained to grow up a, tree, a tall tree stump? Yes, um, I've seen it uh, grow, growing in a variety of locations in different public gardens. Um, as I've shown in, in, the, in the picture that uh, displayed it growing on, on a trellis, that was in my own garden, but it, it, can, it can be really trained, it will grow vertically and it can be trained to grow up just about any structure as well as uh, allowed to spread as a, as a ground cover. Okay, and another clarifying question about milkweed. Um, a gardener wants to know if she can't find swamp milkweed can she plant the common variety in a separate area from her native garden bed? Uh, I'm assuming that the idea behind planting it separately is maybe to control its uh, more aggressive spread. And if so, I think, I think that would be a good solution. Ideally, um, if, she is, if she is local and, and able to go to these, some of these native only sellers that uh, the chances are pretty good that that plant would be um, obtainable. All right, and a little back and forth we had on the chat about um, the light needed for oak leaves. Is it sun and or shade? Um, I actually have mine growing in, in a fairly sunny location in my garden, but, but it's actually oak leaf hydrangea that you're seeing pictured here. This was a photo I took in Fern Valley, um, the native plant area at the National Arboretum, and it was growing as an understory plant. Uh, in our Glen Carlin demonstration garden, it's growing on the north side um, of the library, and, and it does very well there. So it, so it seems to adapt to, uh, to a range of growing conditions. All right, and a clarifying question about New Jersey tea is needed. Um, this gardener has heard that it handles dry shade and also likes moisture. Can you please clarify about the, the water needs? Okay, I personally think of New Jersey tea as one of the most drought tolerant plants. Um, it, it has an, an extensive, um, very deep rooted uh, root system. And uh, so that was why I recommended it for, that, for the hellstrep conditions. Um, I also think of it as a plant that's going to prefer the sunny conditions, especially for flowering, but I, I guess it may tolerate some uh, partial shade. All right, and can switchgrass um, be cut in June to prevent flopping later in, in the year. So I guess this is the equivalent, can it be pinched back like our perennials? You know what? I haven't really done that. Um, that that's a good question. I'd like, to, I'd like to look further into that because I've mainly used that pinching back technique for, uh, for my herb, herbaceous perennials, the ones that are, that are not in the, the graminoid family. Um, because that some, of, some of the cultivars, some of the particular uh, switchgrass species can grow quite tall. Um, one problem with some of these heavy rain events that we're beginning to see, these uh, cloud bursts of many inches of, of rain um, with, that we're beginning to see with, with uh, our changing climate, that, that can really batter down a number of plants, but I'll look further into this. When, when I uh, handle the captioning for this recording, right before the recording is posted, I always go back and look through the chat box to see if there's questions where I can maybe uh, provide a little more information. And I uh, will be pr providing this in what I refer to as an addendum document. We'll be sending this out to everyone who has participated today, and it will also be posted on the website along with the recording. So I will look further into uh, that question of how to handle uh, the, the tall growing grasses. Mm -hmm. 
And uh, one gardener has a problem with deer. So do you suggest or can Turks cap lily be grown in containers? Uh, I, I would think it could, as long as you've got a container that's that's large enough because it's, you know, it's a substantial plant. You'll want to have have room for it and and follow the the guidance, uh, making sure to plant the bulb deep enough so that you know wind won't won't uh, knock it over. I, I think that might be might be a solution. Um, one thing that I will also add in that addendum document is um, some references to websites on deer resistant plants. I've tried here to, to mention the ones that either are deer resistant or, or are particularly prone to, to deer uh, predation. Uh, and when folks follow the links to the, uh, the tried and true fact sheets, that's something we always try to mention. Uh, under the characteristics of the plant, we mention, do they tolerate uh, drought? Do they tolerate um, flooding? Will they tolerate rabbits or deer? Uh, are they tolerant of black walnut? So um, that's an important reason to refer to the fact sheets before you make a final decision on which plants you, you'd like to add to your own garden. Okay, I think um, those are, that's the end of our general questions. I think there were a few very specific design issues. So as was mentioned, we do have a help desk. So people can send their very specific questions, specific to their own gardens to, um, to that address. So that's, I think that's, that's all for questions, Elaine. Okay, that's good. That's an excellent suggestion, Julie. And as I mentioned, I will also take a look at any chat box questions that haven't been addressed during the Q&A uh, today. And, and I'll see if I can provide some additional helpful information. So um, I wish you all happy gardening during the summer months. I want to extend a big thank you to um, our program coordinator, Leslie, and to Colleen, Julie, and Nicole, who have uh, provided wonderful background support for me today. Thank you so much.